Hello, everybody. This is uh, the Nimitza Office Hour, uh, uh, June 7th. Uh, so we're here with uh, Jeff Hawkins, Nimitza co-founder of Subtai Mod, VP of Research Engineering, and several other engineers from the from the NUPIC team. UA, uh, research Scott, team. James Bond. <laughs> James Bond. Right. Right, hiding in the corner there. So the, the topic for today, if you've read on our forums, is uh, recent uh, video that we posted of Jeff explaining some of the new sensory motor inference theory that we'll be, we'll be working on. Um, so we're, we want to field questions from anybody. We already have a few people joined in, so we'll probably just start with people who were joined live. As you guys run out of questions, you can drop off. If other people want to come on, they can. If you're watching this right now on YouTube or Google+, you, you should be able to join using the link that I just posted on HTM forum or on Gitter or on our G Plus page. So find that link if you want to join. Um, otherwise, there's a Q&A interface. You can type in your question as a comment, and uh, I will keep track of those. So you, so uh, we'll field those as they come across. But um, for now, I think let's. I'd love to, like to start this off with with you differentiating between the different types of columns that there's been a bit of confusion about in this discussion. When we say mini column, when you say portable column, you know, there's some naming problems here. Maybe you can talk about how you think of who's, it. Who's you're looking you, at me, you, Matt? Jeff, yes. Uh, well, OK. <laughs> I think uh, the mini column is pretty uncontroversial. Uh, that's a physical thing that you know exists. Uh, it starts at the development of the brain, and there, there are somewhere around 100 to 120 cells in this very, very skinny column that goes across all layers. Um, somewhere between 30 and 50 microns wide. And so that's been known for a long time. And um, it's also, they're, sometimes they're, visu they're actually uh, visible under the microscope, sometimes they're not. Uh, they're, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that they're partly defined by certain, um, certain inhibitory cells and so on. But now we've used the minicom for a long time. We've used that in our temporal memory algorithm. It's, it's kind of the core of the temporal memory algorithm. And we have proposed a functional need for minicolumns. So that's nothing's changed there. And in the new work, we're still keeping the exact same minicolumns and all that. In the in the temple memory, you couldn't do anything with a minicolumn. You had to always have some number of them. And we typically use 2048. Um, that's a good number. You can get down to as little as a thousand, um, but then you start losing some of your SDR properties. So we picked 2048. And that block of minicolumns, the way we use it in the temple memory. Uh, in some sense, they they're all the output of the SP, the spatial pooler, and therefore they're they're not uh, they're not differentiated other than the, um, in in terms of topology. They're just like a, a unit, and that's how we always worked. Um, that that is not exactly correct from a biological point of view because the cortex is sort of a continuum of these things. But it it works when you just think about like okay, the, what's the inhibitory spread between the minicoms? Now in the new stuff, we're basically doing the same thing. Um, and uh, where we are essentially defining sort of the minimal amount of cortex we can use to do spatial temper uh, sensory motor inference. And one way to think about it uh, that's, that's been helpful for us, or for me at least, is instead of thinking of a continuous sensor like the retina or the continuous space on your skin, you can just think about, oh, what if I just think about the tips of my fingers? And those, those are not represented uh, those are sort of somewhat separately really represented in the cortex near each other, but divided. And we can just think about having the minimal size. Um, uh, now this thing's coming up on the screen there. Is that something I'm supposed to read? Uh, no. <laughs> OK. It's like right in my face. Um, so um, and, and it's really not much different than we did with the temple memory uh, algorithm. But uh, we we are, it's a little bit more. We're trying to use multiple ones at once now. A memory algorithm. We just had one, and we could do sequence memory of just one of these things. But now we have multiple ones, so we have to start thinking about them. Like ones representing different parts of the different tips of the different fingers, or different parts of the retina. And um, so now, what do we call that? In in biology, actually, there's as I said, there's a continuum. It's not like they're really rigidly divided. Some places you can see that, like in the rat and barrel cortex, but in most places you can't. So, but we can think of it that way, as if they're rigidly divided, as if they really are in the fingertips. Um, uh, we just we haven't had to address the name for this before because we haven't had multiple ones. We've always just in the temple memory, we've only just had one, and so now we're going to have multiple of them. And so we've talked about using the term hypercom or corticalcom or cortical module. 
um, they're all kind of referring to the same thing. It's basically a, enough of cortical tissue, a couple thousand mini columns, where they're all sort of under the same auspices of one spatial pooler and uh, sort of mutually inhibitory. And um, I think Fergal suggested using the term cortical column. That's one we've considered. I like it because it's CC. That's easy. Uh, one of the problems in uh, this is a long answer. I hope that's okay. <laughs> one of the problems is there's a long history of this nomenclature, and so you can find that there's a paper I like, which I've read, um, and other ones that basically say, "Hey, the cortical column doesn't exist. It's nothing. It, it's not real." And um, so, by using that term, you sort of invoke the, the skepticism of some people. So, uh, but we haven't decided the term for it yet. But it's basically just multiple ones of the things we've been doing before, and recognition that um, in reality in cortex there's a continuum of these things, but we don't have to think about it that way at the moment. That's a long answer. That's okay. Uh, so, uh, Did anyone else go to add to that? I guess another name we've considered is cortical module, yeah. which is also used in neuroscience. And from a software standpoint, I kind of like it because it's... It <laughs> sounds it, like a software module. Well, it's a software module, but it's a repeated <laughs> component that's used over and over again, which is yeah. analogous to the way we're thinking of it. Yeah. In some sense. Cortical so. macro. Cortical macro. <laughs> no macros. No macros. Well, yeah, I don't know. We have no, we, we have we have set, we have set, set on this yet at all. Although I was writing about it today, I was I, was, I kind of like Virgil's idea of CC. It's easy to write just two letters. <laughs> so, we haven't decided yet, and we're open to suggestions too. So, so uh, David Ray is chatting some questions, which you're free to do if you're if you're joined in. He says is. Is there evidence in the biology that the transform that we're speaking of is actually occurring? And is it known how the transform is executed in the biology? And you alluded to this in the video. Uh, is this a, a learned procedure? If it's a learned procedure, how do, how do we do it? Uh, is everyone going to know what we're talking about here? Uh, yeah, I'm assuming that everyone has watched the video that I've linked everywhere. So <laughs> if you haven't, uh, go watch the video. It's linked everywhere. I mean, I don't mind telling this. I don't mind anyone else talking about this, too. So. Yeah. Um, first of all, this this sort of transformation has been known to needed. It's understood in the non neuroscience literature. It's it's a, a fundamental premise of robotics and anybody who's doing a you know body to space transformation. Uh, so it's not a new idea at all. And um, and I think it's been known to be needed in biology. Uh, it's sort of an obvious sort of thing that has to happen. I don't think. I'm not aware of anyone who's actually sort of speculated on neural mechanisms for that. Maybe there have been. The U.A. shaking his head. I don't know. James Bond over here saying, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, why do we call him James Bond? <laughs> anyway, UA, UA says no. I'm not aware of it either. Um, but it's kind of like, it, I, mean, I, mean, I can't say, that nothing is totally 100% obvious, but it's pretty clear that this has to happen. And, um, and it's complicated. It's not easy. This is not a simple thing to do. Uh, but it really has to happen, and uh, and it's known that it has to happen. Outside of neuroscience, it's known it has to happen. Inside of neuroscience, it's known to happen. It has to happen. But no one's really proposed, as far as we know, many mechanisms for this. Um, but given we can define what it is and what it has to do, then and you know it has to occur in the neural tissue. Also, the, our current belief, pretty strongly, is that it has to occur everywhere in the in the cortex. It's it's a fundamental property of all. Uh, all sensory cortex, at least uh, you know, primary and secondary and tertiary and sensory cortex. So it's not like some little thing that's occurring over here. It's a pretty fundamental thing that has to happen everywhere. Um, so that's that's pretty much yeah. And there's papers which oh, I read a paper here. I, I don't know if I referred to it in that talk I gave, but there was a paper here was doing psychophysics that I was talking about, where people study the time it takes to do these mental rotations or these transformations. And so there's some a lot of psychophysics evidence that this is going on in the brain. Um, and there's some evidence about how it works uh, in, from a psychophysics point of view, not from a neuroscience point of view. So um, yeah, it exists, and um, and it, it all of a sudden it gives you some real. Now there's a lot of neural machinery in a region of cortex in the different layers that we've never had a really good explanation for at all. And now when you're trying to solve this problem of this transformation, you need a lot of neural machinery to do it. And so all of a sudden you can start laying this into some of the, the stuff going on in layer six and layer four and maybe the thalamus that we didn't have a reason for before. So it's, we don't have any answer to it yet, but all of a sudden we have a set of requirements, of a functional requirements. You've got a set of neural tissue that has to implement it. It's not trivial. Um, and so that's a good formula for figuring it out. Yeah, to answer your question, David, your obvious question, no, we 
don't know how the transform function works. I guess I didn't answer the question. <laughs> well, yeah, he had, has multiple yeah. questions. But it's not, it's not like we have no idea how it works. We have clues as to, the, to where it is and what its functions are, and what features it has to have. So it's not like we're just totally in the woods. We're uh, blind about it. It, it. We have a lot of constraints on the problem, and that, that's always a great place to start for solving it. Maybe another thing I can add in is, even though they haven't found necessarily direct evidence for transforms, there are different frames of reference that are known in the, in the brain. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly lots of areas where you're sense, sensing things that are relative to the sensory frame of reference. Whatever, you know, retina is just relative to wherever your eye, you, you know, uh, um, you know, pixels on your eye. And then in premotor cortex, there are frames of reference that are body-centric. So it represents a position that's independent of the position of your body, but a position of your uh, limbs, but it's specific to uh, some you know location that's relative to the center of your body. And in the hippocampus, there are you know place cells which seem to be um, you know environment uh, centered, uh, not centered on your body necessarily, but it's specific. Uh, it's a frame of reference that's uh, or in focus on on the environment. So. I think uh, the important point made there is that in the premotor cortex, which is really very close to I me, mean, it's not very far off the hierarchy. You see this transform of sort of happening. Yeah, it's, so, so it's that's not, what I'm saying. Is that yeah, it's, you have the transform has to be happening. It has to be if, happening. If very we low have down. all these different frames of reference. Yeah, it's not happening so, some high place in the cortex. It's happening everywhere yeah. and happening very rapidly. And um, uh, so it's it's yes. So you mean it's not having a high place in the cortex? It doesn't require a hierarchy. It's, it's certainly it's it's, it's going to be happening in every region. So right. V one, V two, S one, S two, whatever right. you want to call it. It's a core aspect. It's a core aspect, aspect of all. You know, you, you look at with every region of cortex has certain uh, cellular and layer properties that are preserved, and um, it's going to be involved. It's going to be one of those. It's involved in that. Uh, by the way, we're spending a lot of time looking at layer six. There's a great paper by Alex Thompson about layer six. Um, and it goes into great detail about what layer six is doing, but layer six has this, it's two things, layer six A and six B, and it's communicating with the wear pathway, and this is a really prime area for understanding what's going on, because layer six is the primary input to layer four. Uh, surprisingly, it's 65% of the input to layer four. So um, uh, there's clues there. This is, this is, it's going to be involved in this, and the wear pathway, as we know, is in body sensor coordinates, and the what pathway is basically recognizing things in objects centered sort of coordinates. So um, there's a, we can be pretty certain that the machinery is yeah. involved in that. I mean, if we if we know that some regions are doing some sort of transformation, and if you assume that every region is doing the same computation, then you have to deduce that every region is doing yeah. transformations. Yeah, yeah. It's and the other way around. Yeah, it. and that those layer six properties I was talking about apparently they occur everywhere. You find these layer six communications to the wear pathway. These layer six eight six be everywhere. So they're there. It's a common feature. It's almost certainly involved. So. Um, we've got uh, Dimitri, Glenn, and, and Martin online. Do you, either any of you have a question you'd like to unmute yourself for? Uh, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, I'll move on to more of David's comments on other things. They keep coming. <laughs> I see David's comments on the right there. Yeah. Hey guys, I, I didn't mean anything by asking those questions. I just I just I'm just kicking all the elephants in the room. That's all. We like it. Look, okay, we're, cool. here, we're pulling our hair out trying to figure this stuff out. So, it's, it's not, <laughs> no, no, I'm sure, I'm sure. I really appreciate you. Uh, you know, obviously, you're staying. I spent the last things. six hours today just drawing pictures of this stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> over there, to continue working on it. For Fergal, I saw, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, not for Fergal. I mean, you, you, you posted a picture. You didn't draw that one, I guess. Uh, so you just asked David about the where and what pathways. What was your question there? What is it? Do you know what those are? Are you asking um, no, I have no clue. But what I was this when you were discussing this with Fergal, it's it was actually the first I had ever heard of him, um, and uh, and I was just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail, um, you know, about what they are. Yeah, sure. Someone else talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you, you looked at some yeah. papers on where and what pathways. Uh, in the Vero system. Uh, when the viral information first arrives in primary viral cortex V1, it's split, split up into two pathways. One is known as the wall pathway, which is uh, concerned about extracting the identity of the object, like for object recognition, face recognition, that's in the ventral stream of the, uh, in the bottom of the uh, of your brain. And the other pathway is known as a wear pathway. It cares less about what is being present in the image, like 
doesn't care about the texture or the color of the object, but it cares about uh, the location of uh, of visual objects. That's known as a wear pathway. So yeah. But anyway, it's one. it's it's in the visual system. But we've also we looked at papers and we've and it's pretty well documented. It's also in the auditory system and the somatosensory system. So it's a it's a kind of common feature of all sensory processing is that the input comes in from the senses, and it goes in two parallel hierarchies. Um, and one is associated, as, as you always said, with sort of like where objects are in your body space and related to actions related to your body. And the other one, the the one people think about most is like what the objects are and uh, and actions related to the object. So you have these two parallel things going on, and they talk to back and forth to each other continuously. That's what I mentioned in layer six. So you have this sort of combination of where something is and what something is, and it's funny because those two hi the hierarchies are different, but the regions are very very similar. They you know so you know, they look identical. So you got the same layer structure in there. So the basic idea is that uh, they're getting slightly different input, and one's modeling like we think one's modeling proprioceptive sense, and the other's modeling like uh, you know more than visual sense or uh, the, the object senses. But anyway, there's not a lot. There's a lot known about them, but not a lot known about it. But it seems to be pretty um, uh, important. And I think in that talk, I talked about them a bit. Uh, did I? I forget. The wear and wipe band. Yeah. A bit. A bit. Yeah. Uh, um, but I didn't. You, but maybe you can talk. Is is this? Are you talking about from layer? Six to layer four across different regions. Uh, no, I'm talking about if I, if I have a region in the what path and a region in the where path, where their layer six is communicating. Oh, okay. So I mean, the basic idea is imagine I'm if I'm moving something in my body space, like I'm moving my hand forward, where it moves on an object is dependent on where, the orientation of the objects and so on. So I can't say that I'm moving my hand forward is going to be moving on any particular thing on the, on an object. You have to make transform. And similarly, if I want to move from one feature of an object, like is my coffee cup. I want to move some on feature here. If I want to move my finger around the circle, the behavior I have to do is dependent on where the where the cup is. If I tilt the cup like this, it's a different behavior. If it's tilted, it's a different position. And so you have to go back and forth. This is again, this has been known in robotics for a long time. You have to go back and forth between a movement. You know, if I want to make a movement on a, on an object, I have to transform that into a, a specific movement in my body. Which is dependent on where the object is. So I can't always say move your hand in a certain way to, to get from the rim to the handle. Uh, it depends on where the object is. So you have to. There has to be this transformation between like, hey, I want to make a movement. If I make a movement in my body space, what's the impact on the on the object? If I make a movement on the object space, uh, or I want to get to someplace on the object, how do I actually make that happen in my hand? Um, so you, it, this is a, a very well under, a known problem, not well understood problem, but a very known problem. And you can solve it using traditional coordinate geometry type of stuff, but the brain doesn't seem to do it that way. You know, it's like you can do it in you know basic math. Feel like oh x y z coordinates. And, uh, we have to do it with SDRs. We have to do it with SDRs. Yeah, neurons. There's no uh, there's no eighth grade geometry teacher in there. So I just noticed uh, Dean joining. Um, Dean, you've been active uh, the past couple of days. Do you have any uh, questions for Jeff or Subutai? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. But uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. I just uh, thought I'd hang out and listen in. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> I can, you know, I can just say a little bit more about this. We, we, um, there's some things about this, these new theories we're very, very excited about. I'm, I'm very excited about. There's something we just don't understand. And this transformation issue, the nature of the, the coordinate space that objects are represented, um, is confusing. Um, so that's an active problem that a number of us are working on. And it's not easy, and if anyone else really, really wants to get into it, great. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm fairly confident we'll solve it, but it's, uh, you know, it's until you do, you're never 100% certain. Uh, but it's a challenge. But there's so much compelling about the rest of it that it feels like, okay, this is, this is a problem we have to solve. And, um, and you know, David was also talking about some process questions earlier a little bit, blazing over it. Um, and he was asking, like, how do these realizations of yours or these aha moments, as far as the theory goes, get translated in, or escalated into actual theories? And then what's the process for turning those into algorithms? Like, what's the plan? Uh, how <laughs> what, what can they expect, right? Uh. <laughs> well, I can talk a little bit more about the second part of it. I think we, we talk about these theories. We have uh, quite 
extensively, and we've walked through you know the assumptions and the properties we're looking for, how it might be manifested in the biology, and then what I like to do is to try to take that into one level more of detail, of at least pseudocode level detail, uh, so we can understand it's precisely how it might be implemented in a neuron, what the rules might be, what it, what the diff, what what you want to do in all of the different conditions. So that's kind of um, the level of detail that I, I like to be in, and that, that way, from there, implementing is pretty straightforward. Um, but I think going from, uh, I have no idea how Jeff gets his breakthroughs, but <laughs> <laughs> but from the theory to the pseudocode level is a really tough process. I often, uh, uh, at least for me, I, I think we, we go through a sort of a cycle here. Um, I think I think in uh, I don't think mathematically. I don't think in pseudocode. I think in sort of uh, visual. Um, physical, it's hard to describe sort of physical constructs in the neuroscience. Um, and then uh, Subutai tries to translate that. Yue is also really good at the neuroscience, so he comes back and says, that's not true, or this is true. Scott is, is sort of a great critic, and um, comes <laughs> and he, he's very quick at pointing holes, like, you, that doesn't make sense, like, uh, you know, from a, from a, both across the neuroscience and the theory point of view. Uh, but it, it's um, there's no uh, there's no defined process. <laughs> one, one one technique I've seen you use over the years that's been very effective is don't get too narrowly thinking about one thing. Is there's always like a hundred different constraints that have to be satisfied simultaneously, um, or many 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 constraints. So it's easy to think of a solution that uh, solves one particular problem or one aspect of it, but it's really hard in some sense, to think of a solution that meets all of the constraints. Yeah. And that's something that I think you have a really and, good discipline. And, and what happens is that the more constraints you throw onto the problem, the harder it seems initially. Um, it's just like, oh my god, there's so many things like that. But, if you can get, but when the answer comes, it's more clear that it's the right answer. In this particular case, not only are we trying to figure out uh, what I like to figure out how we learn, to inf learn and infer what objects in the world are through touch and vision and so on, um, I also want to, like, the same mechanisms that are generating behaviors on those objects, uh, we want to understand. Or when objects move, like when we think about a pen, you know, it's not just a static object, the, the, the little clip bends and the cap comes off and ink comes out the bottom and so on. Um, that's all happening everywhere in the cortex. And so, it's, you know, what we really like to do is come, I'm trying to do it be nice if we come up with a theory that explains not only how do we infer what these objects are, but we also at the same time Movement not only tells me what to predict, but it also sometimes changes the object. So there was a, there's, there's a series of large number of problems we might be able to solve all at once here. How do you behave and how objects transform under behavior? Um, I'm not sure we'll get all that done, but uh, it would be nice to try that. You know, what we did with the sequence memory many years ago with the temple memory is we just picked a thing of uh, how do you form representations in large sequences, and that was, that was a good chunk to pull off. Um, and it took us a real long time to really get a deep understanding of it. Um, and now we're trying to pick off a really big next chunk, um, much bigger than the first chunk, but we have a nice foundation to work with. But if we can, if we just fall back and figure out how we do infer uh, and make predictions about uh, non-moving objects, well, that would be all right, too. Uh, any questions from you guys online? Could be short. Yeah, it could be a short. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> Have there been any on the forums? That uh, I just looked. I don't see any. Usually when we do this, there's a Q and A, but there's not this time. Oh well. Um, but we do have 12 viewers in addition to these guys. I had a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you're talking about an object being represented in object space, and you're maybe talking about a pen, like your, your example. I'm assuming that that object being represented in your brain is a generic representation of a pen. Right, uh, based upon all the different pens or objects like that. that no. You've seen. no, maybe it's both. Okay, that's what I was right. Confused so here's that. here is uh, this is what a uniball uni pen. Yeah. I know this pen. I have these pen. I play with these pens quite a lot, and you know this is Subutai's. And uh, and so you have certain expectations about this very pen, you know. So um, and then I have other pens I know, but then I can get a new pen, which is some more generic, right? So the problem is you have to be able to, sometimes you have a very, very specific knowledge about something. Um, and you have, and you know the details of that. And, and it can't vary much from that at all. Your, your predictions are very precise. Other times you have a more generic version. That's one of the problems we're trying to solve here. It's, it's easier actually to define a precise pen 
exactly, I know exactly what this pen's supposed to behave like because it's the one I'm familiar with and the one I've trained on. It's a little harder to say, like, oh, how do I understand what a generic pen is and have expectations about it? Um, so it's both. Okay. It seems like the more you know, the more you train on a particular thing, the more you, the more precise you have a definition of that thing. Right. Like, I know you pretty well, Matt, so I can make lots of very precise predictions about you, but I meet some other guy in the street kind of like you, but I don't know him. I wouldn't make it precise. I would just make generic predictions about that. Stereotypical predictions. <laughs> yeah, like stereotypical predictions. Yeah. I don't know what's thoughts about that. But. Well, let me check real quick and see if there's any other uh, forum questions. Um, I don't think I saw any. Uh, I didn't understand that. Do we want to talk about that post here? Uh, Fergals? No, the one with the picture of the neurons. Did anyone else read that? Oh, uh, yeah, I read it. I think I think Fergal answered him. It's a bit of a, that that photograph is, is not the detail that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so I don't see any other questions on the forum or on. I imagine Fergal's asleep now. Maybe I don't know. He, it was, it's midnight there. I know, him. I'd be asleep about <laughs> He uh, sort of implemented that he might be on, but no. Uh, David says, do we have an idea of the kinds of problems solving this SM theory implementation will bring about, sensory motor theory? Uh, uh, what kind of problems is this going to help us solve? Like, uh, assuming that we have implemented some of this. Is that like, what can we do with this? Yeah, I think so, right, David? Oh. Is there an idea yeah. of how the interconnection between the macro columns will be implemented? That's a different question. That's a different question. <laughs> well, we have an idea of the kinds of things we can do with the, you know, the, the current breakthrough that you guys yeah. have done. And I was just wondering, you know, with with the addition of the sensory motor stuff, um, you know, do have you guys given any thought to probably? I mean, all of this stuff. I'm bombarding you with all this stuff, but you know, right. have you given any idea of how? <laughs> any, you know, you what know, the, kinds of things? Yeah, what, there's, what two of, there's two ways to yeah. approach that, pro that question. Uh, one that I like, but it, it doesn't always work for other people, <laughs> is I like to think of it very generically. Like you're discovering the structure of the world when the world is not moving on its own. Like, and that's where most of the structure of the world is. And you can think about it independent of vision or touch or anything. It's just it's how you how the how you make a system like. That, that interacts with the world and builds a model of the world. It's a very, very generic uh, idea. But then you, you want to do something practical with it. Well, there's a lot of practical things. The first thing you think about is you can build you know, robots, robotic arms, something that pick things up and immediately know what it is and how to manipulate it. Um, uh, things we do ready, very rapidly and, and simply uh, that's, that's an example that you might just you know, put in human level behavior. Um, but you know, it could be anything. It's I don't know, really well, abstractly. If you think abstractly in a virtual space, if, if you can put an actor in any space that has the ability to take action in that space, I mean, the obvious yeah. thing is in a video game. You could have an AI entity in a video game that can move through the whole world. But if you think about the internet as a world, and you can wrap this type of uh, AI entity that has some motor integration um, with an interface that understands uh, communication protocols, it could explore the entire internet. Like, look, yeah. and, and given some goal or goals to attain, yeah, um, just by following those links yeah. or calling those APIs or, or whatever. Yeah, I think it's you know I I think it's even broader than that. If you think about all the things humans are able to do, uh, I think I've said this in previous posts. I don't. There are really only two ways of discovering the structure of the world. One is the world is moving, and the other is you move through the world and interact with the world. And the vast majority of learning is the latter type. Everything work we've done up to now is the former type. So this is a big, I think mathematics is, is a derivative of this. That is, mathematicians, you have concepts that are like have structure, and you're manipulating them, and you flip them around, and you do transformations on them, which are like motor behaviors. This is a very abstract thing, but the generic algorithms that the cortex implements, oh, they were evolved for vision, touch, and hearing, they obviously work for other things that are not like that at all. And so I believe that the generic algorithms can say, like, I'm not, it's not restricted to three-dimensional spaces. It's not restricted to movements that are in three-dimensional spaces that we're used to. Um, but the, their learning algorithms really could be applied to any kind of uh, structure in any kind of high-dimensional space, any kind of transformations and behaviors. And I think it's what we do when we do mathematics and when we do physics and when we do computer design or software design or whatever. 
Um, so very, very high level, I think this gets at the core of how we model the world and how we discover structure and how we manipulate that structure to achieve certain ends. So it's a, it's a you know, there's not going to be like, a, I don't think there's a, a third or a fourth way of, of building models of the world. These are the two basic core things. And um, so this should go a long way. If we can figure this out, if we can do it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a lot of legs to it over time. It's a very powerful idea um, that you have, you know, but, but again, you could build video games, you could build robots, you could, you know, you know, things just search the internet, and, um, you know, even discover the structure in a file that's sitting there, a static file. Um, so we don't really know yet, but it's the concepts are quite quite large. So uh, Glenn has a question on for chat about the uh, the why why neurons have thousands of synapses paper. Um, so this is a good form to sure. Mind to enter here. Um, uh, it's pretty specific. So understand if no one remembers off the top of your head, the paper ends with an HTM curve versus a first order model in a system with 50% patterns and 50% noise. Do you remember how many different patterns there were mixed in with the noise? Was it one pattern and then one pattern changed during the transition in the middle, or was it a specific other number of sequences that, that anyone remembers? I can bring the paper up. Like, I, I bet you, um, I bet you, super dying you would remember the answer to that. Yeah, so that the code, so the code for that is actually in NuPic research. So anyone can take a look at that. Um, basically, it's uh, it's a sh sequence where you have six elements in a row, and then four elements of noise, and then six elements in a row. Um, so you know, it's a sequence, noise, sequence, noise, and I think there were. Um, I don't remember. I think there were like six different sequences or ten different sequences. I don't. I don't remember. I, I thought it was eight, but, but I don't. I didn't do the work. I just thought it, maybe it was eight. It was some. It was a small number of specific high order sequences. Do you remember? Do you remember? Is this it? That's a that's a different figure. I remember, oh. but it's around that number, eight to ten, maybe. Well, yeah. If you go to NuPic Research, I can uh, point you to the piece of code. I think you know. It's I, actually in there. Correct uh, me if I'm wrong. The actual number. You know, we could have made it 20 or 50 or 100. It'd just take a lot longer to train. I think that's yeah, like, it was only a training issue. Yeah, it's, it's, not, not it's, relevant. it's not like a capacity issue or uh, an accuracy issue. It's really just a time to train issue. Yeah, if you go to projects and then sequ uh, go down to sequence lear uh, learning, sequence learning, yeah, and then sequence simulations. So if you go down a little bit. Um, there's this function get high order sequence chunk. I think that's is that it. Uh, yeah. There's so there's yeah. So there's five sequences, and then uh, in the continuous learning case, we switch over to another five sequences. I'm gonna post this in chat so you can have it. Oh, yeah. So I must have been thinking of something else. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's that's just purely a, a speed issue. There's the capacity of the sequence memory is really high. Yeah. And, and elsewhere in the paper, we actually t uh, try to walk through the capacity. So there you go, Glenn. He says, thanks so much. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. <laughs> that was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us exactly what you did. OK, we can look that one up. Tell us what you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. How does the thing work that you don't understand yet? <laughs> OK. So uh, hey. yeah, David, you you're off the line. Yeah. <laughs> um, you had some other uh, questions. Oh, oh. No, a bunch of questions just popped up. Oh, all right. <laughs> so let's they, were, they were working their way through yeah, the other um, <laughs> So Janet says, on sensory motor, aren't psychotic movements uh, sensory motor driven, and hence they are part of recognition? And so you can have a fully useful sensory motor sensor with it not really moving in a physical way. Uh, wait, wait, wait. I thought the, the last sentence confused me. I mean, uh, uh, saccades does do involve physical movement. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> That's a physical moment. That's that's equivalent to moving your fingers over something, right? You you're moving, you're moving your, your sensor. You're moving your sensor over an object, um, and and the way we're thinking about it now is you don't think of it as one thing. You think about the sensor as a, as a series of these co columns, you know, a series of little uh, pieces. You know, the, the the retina would work even if, you, if it, even if it was like lots of little holes in it. You know, it's like it, or it, it doesn't require that it be continuous. And just like when you touch something, you your fingers are you know, you're not using all of the sensors on your hand. Or you put those 80s glasses on with the, you know, the bars over them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. And you see, anyway, so the point is, um, yes, yeah, so the retina is just like moving your fingers. 
and um, and you're sensing different parts of the object, and that's a motion to. Uh, and this theory says you have to do that to learn. You you cannot infer something until you've touched it in many many different ways or looked over it many many different ways. After you've learned it, you can sometimes infer in a single touch or a single vision, a single glance. Um, sometimes you can't, and sometimes to get the right inference, you have to look over something multiple times or touch it multiple times. And say, oh, I, now I know what it is. Even with uh, uh, audition. You hear a sound you've never heard before. Your head instinctively snaps. Yeah, you. So I, where did that come yeah, from? Yeah, this I need more exactly that. And that uh, that argument's been made a long time ago. That actually, even in, even audition, you you have movement that helps you. It changes the input, which tells you helps you tell what it is. It's not as obvious or strong in audition, but it's there. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I got some people late. Yeah. Um, so there is no. <laughs> additional information on the transform function. <laughs> we're, we're not sure how it works. We have hints. So. Yeah, but, but Jeff talked a lot about it. Yeah, earlier, earlier yeah. he talked about yeah. it. So go back and review. As soon as we have some know. progress on that, we'll we'll let you know. Um, I mean, I'm impatient to make progress on this. You know, we're talking about it every week, a couple times a week. Um, it's the only thing I really want to work on right now. So, um, and I think uh, Marcus is working on it, and uh, you, you Supertire is working on it. You always work on a bit, so. Um, from Rich, we have a question that he says, but generalization depends a lot on the coding, especially the SDR, doesn't it? I'm not sure I understand that question. On the coding, what do you mean by coding? You I mean, mean I think it's how, how it's encoded in SDR. The representation, I assume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's. Yeah, I think that's just part of it. That is part uh, of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think. In, Having a good encoding of any data, uh, good encoding in SDRs, does help tremendously in the in the generalization. But I think that's only one aspect of generalization. There are many other ways um, that generalization can occur. And some of the stuff we've talked about before of, of, of pooling over, um, uh, you know, if, if you're doing temporal pooling over a sequence of, of notes in a melody, for example, uh, allows you to generalize. Um, and recognize a particular song, and maybe variations of that of that song as well. Um, so this, the encoding is part of it, but it's not the whole story. There's many other aspects of, of generalization. Yeah, we don't understand all of it, but that's right. And the spatial pooler does generalization too. It it figures out which bits in the SDR to ignore, um, and then becomes more noise, uh, more robust to noise as a result of that. I don't understand this question, so I'll ask it. <laughs> How theta gamma coding working memory theory is? I don't. Do you know what theta gamma coding is? Maybe. Uh, UA somewhat. Uh, <laughs> and is that representative? I, I don't think it's representative. So I think we've talked about this before, but I'm going to talk about it again. There are numerous um, uh, uh, oscillation frequencies in the brain. And gamma frequencies and theta frequencies are two of the examples, and um, they clearly play an important part in how the biological tissue works. Uh, the moment we don't incorporate them in HTM theory, and, we're, and the moment we don't have any evidence that they are actually inferential theoretic components, they uh, our current belief, and it could change, is that um, these rhythms are ways for neurons to behave together properly. So in HGM theory, we require that a whole bunch of synapses become active at the same time. In the biology, they have to become uh, like on a dendritic branch. Uh, that's the that's the key part of the temporal memory uh, algorithm, and uh, the active dendrites. And in biology, those synapses have to become active within a few milliseconds of each other, which is very very tight constraint. Um, we don't have that constraint in software, so maybe you know. Some here's an example. Maybe some of those oscillations are just to make sure that the neurons are firing at the same time, so that they actually work on active dendrites. But if we can relax that constraint in software, and we're not actually modeling the, we're not modeling the, uh, the, the the ion channels in a dendrite, and therefore we don't have this constraint of you know within three milliseconds or something like that. So that's kind of an example where it's, it may be absolutely required in biology, but it's not really. Carrying information theoretic importance in in the theory about what the brain is doing, so we don't. We, at the moment, we're not incorporating any of those uh, beyond just sort of saying, "Hey, they may be necessary, but we don't think they're important for our modeling." Okay, um, Shannon, we'd like a quick update on our NLP progress. I don't think there's anything to talk about, Shannon. Um, 
I mean, there's a, if you look, go look at NUPIC research, you'll see some of the code that we built up for it. I think we built up a nice framework for uh, using the cortical I.O. encodings and applying it to classification tasks and, and doing similarity um, and stuff. We've been working with a data set from another organization that, unfortunately, we can't share. Um, but we've been exploring various ways of using the cortical I.O. encoding to um, you know, figure out which documents are more similar to the other and so on. And, and overall, I think the cortical I.O. encodings work pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, there's not a whole lot uh, to talk about there, I think. Uh, one of the, one interesting aspect of that is that um, for that, Marion had actually uh, built, part of this is sort of, you can think of a, a paragraph as a sequence of words. And then when you're trying to recognize similar paragraphs, you're in some sense doing classification on a sequence of words. So it's a type of sequence classification. So Marion has built up a nice little software framework that's in NUPIC research for doing sequence classification. And UA has also been doing a bunch of experiments on not specific to NLP, but just how to use HTMs for doing sequence classifications. And we're, we've been talking about putting some of that code potentially into NUPIC even um, soon. So that's, uh, that, that code is in NUPIC research as well. So. Uh, here's a relevant question from uh, Paulo. Are place cells, what happened? It's gone. Yeah, I think a lot of your questions would disappear. I saw a bunch of other questions we didn't answer. And then yeah, just... it's getting, that's weird. They're just gone. So some of my questions are disappearing. I don't understand what's happening. A bug. But... Oh, here, there it is again. Are place cells or grid cells being looked at, and how will we be doing sensor space and object space mapping? So you you presented recently some paper about uh, grid cells in, the, in a mouse. Uh, Right, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, we did look at place cells and grid cells. Uh, in, and we think it's sharing some of the properties we are looking for in this transformation problem. Uh, but a lot of these studies are uh, looking at the behavior of the neurons, but not, uh, not uh, describing the underlying mechanism behind the transformation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah, so it's evidence that it's happening. Well, yeah, but it's and there's sort of different frames of reference. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the, the so it just means that there is a transform yeah, happening. There is, exactly, it's, yeah, it's right. an absolute yeah. proof that a transform is happening. And as Uwe said, there's no, we don't, not aware of any theories about how that's being implemented in the neurons. Yeah. So yeah. which is something. By the way, you know the GPS encoder we did, which we did before we were thinking about uh, play cells and grid cells, is very similar. It ends with a very, it's almost identical type of representation. So, um, and, uh, you know, we made that up, so that's, that's another good evidence, like, we thought about that. And so we understand that encoder pretty well and how those representations work. So uh, we think something like that's being used here, and you can, you can talk about the properties, but as you said, we don't really know how, it's, how it would be implemented in neurons. So um, we need to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, we have about 15 minutes in the office hour left, so if uh, anyone has any... I saw other questions we did not answer. I, I did, but I don't see them anymore. So I, can people take them back? I, I'm not sure. Or are you I'm, just like... I've never been on the it. other side of this <laughs> interface, so... You're just, uh, you're just trashing but, it left and right. But all the ones that I put in the answer questions... I, I, Someone, I saw a question about intercolumn communication. I'm not sure where that disappeared to. Uh, Okay, well, let me address this one first. Lisp. Whoa. Epic implementation in Lisp dialogue. Marcus, <laughs> come, on. come on down. What improvements can it have versus Python? Well, hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, can we first say uh, congratulations to Marcus? He's a full time Dementia employee now, hired from uh, the Dementia community. Yay. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I guess the question is, what are the improvements it can have versus Python? Uh, being Lisp, I don't know if that itself has much. Um, something we found beneficial, uh, p maybe possibly in Cortex. I'm more experienced with Comportex, which is Felix's and uh, implementation. Uh, it has this useful thing called immutability, uh, and which tends to make things inherently visualizable, uh, so that you bring up Sanity, which is the visualization project for this. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with Comportex, and so that's one of the fundamental things. It has, it has other things. It's really cool for just, like, writing a little bit of code that just, like, does all sorts of incantations. So uh, I think you've also brought up that sometimes the algorithms can be more simply expressed yeah. in that, so if you really want to just understand the, the core of the algorithm, it might be better than a fully 
full-blown, you know, big implementation. Yeah. yeah. That's another... Yeah, and, and I brought up immutability as good for visualizations, but it can also be good for... Uh, you can just try new things that you can't really try elsewhere. You that take a lot more work. For example, if you want to compute the anomaly score for a ton of inputs, there's not really a clear way to do that with HTM because every time you uh, every time you give it a new input, you're going to change it in place. Um, I say with HTM, I should have said with NuPic or with Python. But anyway, there's a, there's a, ser a list of them. I could literally give a whole talk on it. So <laughs> I think you did. Anyway. <laughs> in this room, I may have one. Yeah. Uh, so hey, Felix is watching. Thanks. I think he's up really early. Oh, um, Felix. Uh, you've been looking at retrieval and auto associative networks. Is that part of the picture? Well, someone's paying attention to our NUPIC research. Comments. <laughs> <laughs> Where? How did they, uh, Felix? How did Felix find that out? Because it's in NUPIC research. research. What do we put up there? The experiment I showed yesterday. Oh, oh, I saw. <laughs> it's hot off the press. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nothing you know, escapes Felix. <laughs> Yeah, we are uh, exploring auto-associative memories, and we haven't decided on um, whether it's uh, useful or not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, part of this part of this new idea that Jeff's been talking about is um, uh, if you have these sort of cortical columns, each cortical column may be sensing part of an object. Um, let's say, think about fingers in a hand could be touching a, a coffee mug, and each finger is touching a different part of an object. Uh, from any one finger, you may not be able to identify what the object is, but if you touch several places at once, you may instantly be able to identify it. So um, that's sort of like having multiple things which have portions of patterns or uh, maybe unions of patterns, and then together they kind of collaborate and figure out what is the most consistent and unique representation for the particular sensations that you're getting. And so that has a lot of similarities with some of the associative memory networks that have been out there. And so we're kind of under that context. We're just looking at some of the literature and playing, experimenting with. That's a big part of this new uh, theory is that if you think about your fingers and each one is, if you think about the tips of your fingers and each one is sort of like a column, a cortical column. And as Super I said, if you touch one, one of the, if you reach your hand into a black box and you don't know what you're feeling, and you touch one thing, you probably can't tell what it is, one edge or corner or whatever. But but then all of a sudden, if you have multiple of these things that are sort of independent in the sense that there are different columns representing different parts of your hand, and, and, they, and you get this input once, and they somehow immediately know. So the same input's going on the tips of each finger, and that hasn't changed, but it's the fact you've got multiple ones at the same time. All in the same region, right? Well, not, they're in the same region, but the point of using fingertips, they're not necessarily immediately adjacent to each other. Right. Uh, you know, I could, it doesn't have to be, it could be just different parts of my hand. So the point is, it's not like, like the retina can fool you because you think of the retina will always get this picture, right? Well, when you think about the touch fingers coming, the touch coming from your fingers, it's not a picture anymore. And the fingers are moving sort of independently, and then they're tightly distorted, and you can have different parts of your hand touching this that are not adjacent to one another. So, and uh, so the point is, is that for these sort of multiple, somewhat independent um, sensory systems, each tip of your finger in some way like that they somehow together, they immediately know what the whole thing is. And so they have to communicate. And the idea is that uh, that there are these long distance communications in some layers, in like layer two, which we think is where the optic representation is. And um, so every, read, every little fingertip has its own hypothesis about what the multiple things it could be touching. But the only thing that's consistent across all of them is the one that emerges. And that requires an auto-associative type of memory. It's like basically saying, I have this. This auto associative memory, I have partial inputs to each different part, and each part is, um, is uh, each column is sort of ambiguous, but then the thing settles all at once on the right answer, mm -hmm. which is what auto associative memories do, but they're not typically distributed like that. They're not typically distributed like these different columns that are communicating. It's usually like you just give partial input and then it resolves it. Uh, but the same principles are applying there. And I mean, I wrote about, in non intelligence, I wrote about auto associative mem uh, memory. It's, it's, it's a, clearly has to be part of the brain. It's just like, you know. That's how we work. We, we, we recognize things often by partial input. Yeah, David's saying it seems like it requires hierarchies of places to store the invariance. I think the answer is no to that, right? We'd like it to be no. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, we don't know. Right? I mean, I, we're, we're, one of our philosophies is to try to go as far as we can without relying on hierarchy. Because a hell of a lot of stuff has to happen in each cortical region. 
and really want to push the limits. Well, everything happens in, in a court. Well, court well that, in a sense, I'd like to see that, that in some sense, I'm, that, that's the hypothesis. Yeah. And we'd like to stick with that hypothesis until we know otherwise. It's really tempting all the time to go, hey, I don't understand how this works. Oh, it must be the hierarchy. Oh, I don't understand how that works. Oh, it must be the hierarchy. Um, and, uh, it's not a magical silver. No, it's not. <laughs> so we got a lot of neural machinery in that region and uh, far more than you get between regions. And so uh, we want to understand the hierarchy and we have, we have theories about what it's doing. But um, you, know, you can make a useful system with a single region and we really want to try to do that. So another uh, David question, uh, do we have an idea how the interconnection between these cortical columns will be implemented algorithmically? Yeah, David, in Python. <laughs> <laughs> what, did say list? I don't know. He's struggling to unmute right now. Unmute. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, I, I mean, from a software infrastructure standpoint, it's uh, actually the network API supports all this uh, already pretty well. So uh, implementation-wise, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, algorithmically, you know, what is the information that has to flow across these uh, you know cortical columns, and how do they resolve down to the unique representation? Well, that's some of the stuff we're trying to figure out, and uh, the auto associative memories might give us some clues into it. But we have some ideas about uh, how that works as well. Assuming the, yeah. assuming there'll be some new algorithm components added to spatial pooling. Temporal memory to do this type of uh, layer four layers. Yeah. So some of the uh, so one of the really interesting things is uh, the temporal memory structure and the spatial pooling structure um, is is repeated across the layer. So all of the intuitions that we have from temporal memory uh, really help us in coming up with uh, understanding these new ideas and evolving them. Um, so we we are definitely building on top of the existing structure. Uh, some of the new things they were adding here is one is um, this concept of apical dendrites, which is another type of uh, um, active dendrites, and those take um, typically take uh, input feedback input from layers or regions above. So that's something that we're adding uh, to the system. And then the other big new thing that we're playing around with is the idea of these lateral connections that converge on a unique representation. So these are all kind of generalizations of uh, the infrastructure that we we'll already have algorithmically. So, so At the end of the day, these are all just pyramidal cells. Yeah. Uh, it's just going to be a, a slightly more complicated model of a neuron, but it can't be that much more complicated. Yeah. Um, so we, we're sticking a lot of the basic stuff. I mean, well, one way to think about what are we, what are the couple things we're adding? Well, we're we're adding this idea of multiple cortical columns that are communicating across long distances, uh, which we know exists in the brain, and then we're also adding more layers to the cortical column. Um, so to do the, the transformation, I'm also working on layer five and what it does. So uh, those are the sort of two dimensions, but they're all built, built on SDRs, they're all built on pyramidal neurons, they all have many columns, um, there's an inhibition similar. Uh, there'll be some new things, obviously, there'll be uh, new things, but it's not a dramatic, um, it's not rewriting what we've got, we're basically building on what we've got and just making more variations on it. Do you think it will run into any scaling problems because of the new additions? Yeah, because now we were doing just a single layer before, and now we're going to be doing multiple layers. And not only that, we're going to be doing multiple columns, cortical columns, whereas before we were just doing one cortical column. So right. we're kind of expanding in two different dimensions here. And so, yeah, things are. Well, we, uh, yeah, that's but luckily, cool. Marcus uh, sped up the temporal memory hugely. So uh, We have to be careful. There's two types of scaling problems. There's the one you just referred to, which is a practical one, like, hey, we need to build a bigger system, and it's running too slowly. There's a theoretical scaling issues we have to avoid, which are, you know, is this system going to work when, you know, just is it possible in, in a physical universe to build something that's big? And so, like, we did some work two summers ago with, um, Sensory motor inference, the first attempt at this, where we didn't really think about this uh, uh, coordinate transform. And that didn't scale well. I mean, it had theoretical scaling problems, not practical scaling problems. So we have to make sure that the theories don't have theoretical scaling problems. And then, then, then after that, it's engineering and computers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still going to have the network API as the core API for, for, for NuPic and HTM Java. There may be uh, more things you can put inside of these nodes in different ways to arrange them, I'm assuming. That's yeah, so far I don't know that we need to change the API. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we'll run into something that we need to. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So uh, Martin says, more like uh, DNA in a cell, having a master plan on how to evolve in different situations is always a good thing. That's good. Yeah. I think it's a good analogy. Okay. Um, are there any other questions we're reaching the end right now? I'm going to open up the floor one last time to anybody who's actually connected to the meeting. Go. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? <laughs> I, want, I think it's a great topic. I want to write a book about that. I think about that a lot. Not until you're done with this. No, not a lot. Because it relates to brains. Well, it's, it, the question is, what's the meaning of human life versus the meaning of life in general? So it has a lot to do with it. We can, we can define meaning for You've our life. three minutes. <laughs> well, we also have another question. Let's get, let's get the meaning of life. <laughs> Uh, we we come back to that. We have a whole office. Next hour office hour. <laughs> Next office hour. The meeting. I, I like talking about that. Uh, deep learning accelerated by NVIDIA GPUs, but progress in accelerating NuPic. Uh, you know, can can NuPic run on accelerated GPUs eventually? We can talk about it. We can talk about meeting. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've been just thinking about um, oh, our accelerating. I don't know. If we did. Mm -hmm. There was nothing proprietary about it. We didn't sign. Oh, okay. Sign. Yeah, we met recently with NVIDIA, their head architect. I uh, got in charge of all their designs, their senior guy, and um, we had a nice discussion about, uh, and they were very interested in understanding how, you know, and getting a little bit deeper into our algorithm and talking about how we could accelerate it. And I think the conclusion from that was it's more promising than we originally thought, but you really have to spend some time working on it to find out what GPUs could do for us. So is that a good summary? Yeah, yeah, I think it works. Uh, but I, I don't think people should think that the only way to accelerate it is by putting it on GPUs. Um, I mean, we just got a tremendous acceleration just over the last couple of months because of code optimization work. And I think there's still at least 10 to 100x sitting there still of code optimization that we could do. And right now, the tempo memory is a tiny part of the profile of running uh, a big uh, in a task and the spatial memory and the classifier and other things are huge parts and those haven't really been optimized recently. Of course, so. if we had like three GPU experts on staff, we would probably be doing a lot with GPUs, but we don't, so we're not doing it with GPUs right at the moment. Okay, uh, let's do one last question. We only have about a minute left. There are several questions that just came in. Matt Lind, um, he says, in the new model, are the sensory inputs from different Figures fed into the same region, or each fed into different fingers, fingers. Me, or different regions. So we did answer that, but uh, most likely the same region. Uh, but same region, but different be. cortical columns. Probably. Yes. This yeah. this yeah. is a, the old papers. I forget who did them, uh, but they talked about the mapping of the the skin to the to the, the primary sensory cortex. And they, they, there's that figure, the, the really distorted figure of a monkey mapped onto S1. If you've seen it, it's very famous. I don't know if you know who made that paper, UADM. I don't know. But, but uh, you, I know some of Graziano's papers show that, uh, but I don't know yeah. if he's the one that actually did it. But it's really it. old stuff. Anyway, yeah. you just look at homunculus, search homunculus uh, S1. You almost certainly will find it. Um, and what's interesting about it is, it, like, okay, so the whole body is represented in S1. But it's really distorted, just like the retina distorts V1. It's really distorted by the the, area, the amount of um, sensory bits coming in on the skin. So your fingers and your lips have a lot of sensory bits, and so the lips get really blown up on this one. The finger and the hands are really weirdly distorted. So it's a really odd looking figure. The interesting thing about it, I believe, if you look at the fingers uh, of the hand, even though they're next to each other, I believe they're actually what they show is that. Uh, in some of the layers, the, 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 the neurons are not connected across those. And so that's what we'd expect. And we also expect in some other layers that they are connected across those. Where in or something like V1, it's not as clear because, uh, because the, it's all one sheet. It's, it's less obvious that there's these separate little regions that even though they're co-located, they're actually separate. And they only communicate across in certain layers. So it's a good, it's, um, those papers are probably 30, 40 years old, but um, they're still valid. And that's a big clue, and that's why I'm thinking about somatics, the touch. It's, it's easier to get around some of the things you naturally think about vision, which are misleading. I don't know if that makes sense. I think so. Homunculus. It says homunculus. Okay, so uh, look, I think we're, we're going to adjourn here. So I just want to say thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks, thanks to Jeff and Sue Tai yeah. and the team for taking questions. Um, if you have more questions, go to our forum at discourse.dementa.org.
and sign up and ask questions there. Um, so uh, take care, everybody, and thanks for joining our office Bye. hour. You're welcome. Thanks um, for the thanks. We'll see you later. <laughs> see you later. That's it.